Okay, chapter eight, the potions master. There, look, where? Next to the tall kid with the red hair, wearing glasses. Did you see his face? Did you see his scar? Whispers followed Harry from the moment he left his dormitory the next day. People queuing outside classrooms stood on tiptoe to get a good look at him, or doubled back to pass him in the corridors again, staring. Harry wished they wouldn't because he was trying to concentrate on finding his way to classes. There were 142 staircases at Hogwarts, wide sweeping ones, narrow rickety ones, some that led somewhere different on a Friday some with a vanishing step halfway up that you had to remember to jump. Then there were doors that wouldn't open unless you asked politely or tickled them in exactly the right place, and doors that weren't really doors at all, but solid walls just pretending. It was also very hard to remember where anything was because it all seemed to move around a lot. The people in the portraits kept going to visit each other. Here's a picture. Magic potions. And Harry was sure the coats of armor could walk. The ghosts didn't help either. It was always a nasty shock when one of them glided suddenly through a door that you were trying to open. Nearly headless Nick was always happy to point new Gryffindors in the right direction. But Peeves the Poltergeist was worth two locked doors and a trick staircase if you met him when you were late. He would drop waste paper baskets on your head, pull rugs from under your feet, pelt you with bits of chalk or sneak up behind you, invisible, grab your nose and screech, got your nose. Even worse than Peeves, if that was possible, was the caretaker, Argus Filch. Harry and Ron managed to get on the wrong side of him on their very first morning. Filch found them trying to force their way through a door, which was unluckily turned out to be the entrance to the out of bounds corridor on the third floor. He wouldn't believe they were lost was sure they were trying to break into it on purpose and was threatening to lock them in the dungeons when they were rescued by Professor Quirrell, who was passing. Filch owned a cat called Mrs. Norris, a scrawny, dust-colored creature with bulging, lamp-like eyes, just like Filch's. She patrolled the corridors alone, break a rule in front of her, put just one toe out of line, and she'd whisk off for Filch, who'd appear, wheezing two seconds later, Filch knew the secret passageways of the school better than anyone, except perhaps the Weasley twins, and could pop up as suddenly as any of the ghosts. The students all hated him, and it was the dearest ambition of many to give Mrs. Norris a big kiss. And then, once you had managed to find them, there were lessons themselves. There was a lot of <clears throat> there was a lot more to magic, as Harry quickly found out, than waving your wand and saying a few funny words. They had to study the night skies through their telescope every Wednesday at midnight and learn the names of different stars and the movement of the planets. Three times a week, they went out to the greenhouses behind the castle to study herbology with a dumpy little witch called Professor Sprout, where they learned how to take care of all the strange plants and fungi and found out what they were used for. Easily, the most boring lesson was history of magic, which was the only class taught by a ghost. Professor Binns had been very old indeed when he had fallen asleep in front of the staff room fire and got up the next morning to teach, leaving his body behind him. Binns droned on and on while they scribbled down names and dates and got Emric and the evil and Uric the oddball mixed up. Professor Flitwick, the charms teacher, was a tiny little wizard who had to stand on a pile of books to see over his desk. At the start of their first lesson, he took the register um, like the list of names. And when he reached Harry's name, he gave an excited squeak and toppled out of sight. Professor McGonagall was again different. Harry had been quite right to think she wasn't a teacher to cross. Strict and clever, she gave them a talking to the moment he, they sat down in his first class. Transfiguration is some of the most complex and dangerous magic you will learn at Hogwarts, she said. Anyone messing around in my class will leave and not come back. You have been warned. Then she changed her desk into a pig and back again. They were all very impressed and couldn't wait to get started, but soon realized they weren't going to be changing furniture into animals for a long time. After making a lot of complicated notes, they were each given a match and started trying to turn it into a needle. 
By the end of the lesson, only Hermione Granger had made any difference to her match. Professor McGonagall showed the class how it had gone all silver and pointy and gave Hermione a rare smile. The class everyone had really been looking forward to was Defense Against the Dark Arts, but Coral's lessons turned out to be a bit of a joke. His classroom smelled strongly of garlic, which everyone said was to ward off a vampire he'd met in Romania and was afraid would be coming back to get him one of these days. His turban, he told them, had been given to him by an African prince as a thank you for getting rid of a troublesome zombie, but they weren't sure they believed this story. For one thing, when Seamus Finnegan asked eagerly to hear how Coral had fought off the zombie, Coral went pink and started talking about the weather. For another, they had noticed that a funny smell hung around the turban, and the Weasley twins insisted that it was stuffed full of garlic as well, so that Coral was protected wherever he went. Harry was very relieved to find out that he wasn't miles behind everyone else. Lots of people had come from muggle families, and like him, hadn't had any idea that they were witches and wizards. There was so much to learn that even people like Ron didn't have much of a head start. Friday was an important day for Harry and Ron. They finally managed to get to find their way to the Great Hall for breakfast without getting lost once. What have we got today? Harry asked. Ron poured sugar on his porridge. Double potions with the Slytherin, said Ron. Snape's head of Slytherin house. They say he always favors them. We'll be able to see if it's true. Wish McGonagall favored us, said Harry. Professor McGonagall was head of Gryffindor house, but it hadn't stopped her, giving them a huge pile of homework the day before. Just then, the post arrived. Harry used, was used to this by now, but it had given him a bit of a shock on the first morning, when about a hundred owls had suddenly screamed into the great hall during breakfast, circling the tables until they saw their owners and dropping letters and packages on their laps. Hedwig, Hedwig hadn't brought Harry anything so far, she sometimes flew in to nibble his ear and have a bit of toast before going off to sleep in the owlery with the other school owls. This morning, however, she fluttered down between the marmalade and the sugar bowl and dropped a note onto Harry's plate. Harry tore it open at once. Dear Harry, it said in very untidy scrawl, I know you get Friday afternoons off, so would you like to come and have a cup of tea with me around three? I want to hear all about your first week. Send us an answer back with Hedwig from Hagrid. Harry borrowed Ron's quill, scribbled, yes, please, see you later, on the back of the note and sent Hedwig off again. It was lucky that Harry had tea with Hagrid to look forward to because the potions lessons turned out to be the worst thing that had happened to him so far. At the start of term banquet, Harry got the idea that Professor Snape disliked him. By the end of the first potions lesson, he knew he'd been wrong. Snape didn't dislike Harry. He hated him. Potions lessons took place down in one of the dungeons. It was colder here than up in the main castle and would have been quite creepy enough without the pickled animals floating in glass jars all around the walls. Snape, like Flitwick, started the class by taking the register. And like Flitwick, he paused at Harry's name. Ah, yes, he said softly. Harry Potter, our new celebrity. Draco Malfoy and his friends Crabbe and Goyle sniggered behind their hands. Snape finished calling the names and looked up at the class. His eyes were black like Hagrid, but they had none of Hagrid's warmth. They were cold and empty and made you think of dark tunnels. You are here to learn the subtle science and exact art of potion making, he began. He spoke in barely more than a whisper, but they caught every word. Like Professor McGonagall, Snape had the gift of keeping a class silent without effort. As there is little foolish wand waving in here, many of you will hardly believe this is magic. I don't expect you will really understand the beauty of the softly simmering cauldron with its shimmering fumes, the delicate power of liquids that creep through the human beings, bewitching the mind, ensnaring the senses. I can teach you how to bottle fame Brew glory, even stop death, if you aren't as big a bunch of dunderheads as I usually have to teach. Ooh, he doesn't seem very nice. I have a picture of him. Spooky. Look at all these cool potions.
More silence followed this little speech. Harry and Ron exchanged looks with raised eyebrows. Hermione Granger was on the edge of her seat and looked desperate to start proving that she wasn't a dunderhead. Potter, Nate said suddenly. What would I get if I added powdered root of asphalt to an infusion of wormwood? Powdered root of what to an infusion of what? Harry glanced at Ron, who looked as stumped as he was. Hermione's hand shot in the air. I, I don't know, sir, said Harry. Snape's lips curled into a sneer. Tut, tut, fame certainly isn't everything. He ignored Hermione's hand. Let's try again, Potter. Where would you look if I told you to find me a bozar? Hermione stretched her hand as high into the air as it would go without her leaving her seat. But Harry didn't have the faintest idea what the bozar was. He tried not to look at Malfoy, Crabbe, and Goyle, who were shaking with laughter. I don't know, sir. Thought you wouldn't open a book before coming, eh, Potter? Harry forced himself to keep looking straight into those cold eyes. He had looked through his books at the Dursleys, but did Snape accept him, expect him to remember everything in 1,000 magical herbs and fungi? Snape was still ignoring Hermione's quivering hand. What is the difference, Potter, between Moonshud, Monkshud, and Wolfsbane? At this, Hermione stood up, her hand stretching toward the dungeon ceiling. I don't know, said Harry quietly. I think Hermione does, though. Why don't you try her? A few people laughed. Harry caught Seamus's eye and Seamus winked. Snape, however, was not pleased. Sit down. He snapped at Hermione, for your information, Potter. Asphold and Wormwood make a sleeping potion of powerful, as powerful it is known as the draught of living death. A bazor is a stone taken from the stomach of a goat, and it will save you from most poisons. As far as Monkshood and Wolfsbane's, they are the same plant, which also goes by the name of Aconite. Well, why aren't you copying all that? There was a sudden rummaging for quills and parchment. Over the noise, Snape said, and a point will be taken from Gryffindor House for your cheek, Potter. Right. Not a great teacher. Let's see the next chapter.